It's a nice day today. Yes, it's a perfect day for a birthday party. It's great that so many people are here. So, how do you know Anna? We were at university together. We did the same course. Oh, right. What did you study? English literature. And you? How do you know Anna? I'm her neighbor. I live in the house next door. Really? It's a lovely street. I think so. So, did you come out? How's the food? It's great. The pizza is delicious. It's always nice to get good food at a party. Um, so, do you live near here? Yeah, I live down by the river. You know those flats? Oh yeah, the new ones. They're expensive. How much rent do you pay? Uh, not much. It's not so expensive. Uh... So, what do you do? I work for a bank. So, how much do you earn? Um, is that uh, over there? Sorry. I just have to speak to my friend because... What do you think of the party? Yeah, it's great. It's really nice to meet all of Anna's friends. You? Uh, it's all right, but the music is a bit boring. Mm. I like your T-shirt. Is it for a football team? No, uh, at least I don't think so. So, do you play any sports? No, not really. I don't really like sport. Well, what do you like then? I prefer reading or watching films. Oh. Yeah. So, I might go to the cinema after the party. There's a new film about a man who goes to Peru to visit his brother and... Yeah, I saw that last week. Oh. What was it like? Oh, it's an awful film. Really boring. Okay. Well, I'd like to see it anyway. Perhaps I'll like it. Uh, no, I don't think so. It's a really strange story. And in the end, the man can't find his brother and he just goes home again. Oh, thanks a lot. Tara. Last year, my ex-boyfriend told me he didn't want to see me anymore by text message. What kind of person does that? It was horrible. I called him for days, but he didn't answer. It made me feel like I wasn't important to him at all. I think he just wanted me to go away. What an idiot. Magda. When I want to plan something, I generally just send a text. It's the same when I cancel plans. A text message is easier. You don't need to give a long explanation, you know, a lot of reasons. Or have a difficult conversation. It's better for everyone. Chris. Birthdays are different now. I hardly ever get cards or presents from friends, or even my brother, and no one calls. Everyone just writes happy birthday on my wall on Facebook. It's not very friendly, in my opinion. Mike. My daughter is travelling around South America at the moment. She's writing a blog, so we know what she's doing. But she rarely calls. And I'd love to get a postcard or a letter sometimes. Just to know she's thinking about the family. Annie? Rachel! Long time no see. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> what a lovely surprise. Great to see you. Yeah, you too. When did we last see each other? Oh, I think it was about six years ago. So, where are you living these days? Oh, not far from here. I live on Hampton Street. Do you know it? Yes, I do. That's really close to the centre. Mm. How about you? Uh, we live on Compton Road. Oh, how nice. 
My name's Mark, by the way. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Sorry. Yes, Mark's my husband. Husband? Wow, that's fantastic news. When did you get married? Six Eight months, months ago. ago. <laughs> it was six, Mark. <laughs> well, congratulations. I want to know all the details. Look, I'm going to the cafe down the street now to meet Leo, my boyfriend. Would you both like to come? Yeah, that sounds good. Brilliant. Well, let's go. Do you play much sport? Not really. I occasionally watch the rugby on TV, but I'm not a big sports fan. Did you see the match at the weekend? Oh, not sport again. <laughs> Have you got any exciting plans for next week? Well, uh... No, not really. Just work. I've got a lot to do in the shop this week because we're going to a wedding next weekend. Oh, the shop. What do you do? I'm a florist. What a great job. <laughs> Where's the shop? Not far from here. I'll show you sometime. That would be great. And are you the manager or...? Well, uh, not really. It's my shop. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. So, you're a businesswoman. <laughs> Do you work on your own? No. I have someone to help. Tina. She comes in for a few hours every day. Oh, that's good. How about you? What do you do? Oh, marketing. Boring. Same as Mark. He works in marketing. Oh, I'm sorry. I find it boring. <laughs> Do you have any plans for the weekend? Actually, yes. I'm going to visit my brother, Dan. Oh, I remember Dan. How is he? He's fine. He's married now to Martina. Oh. Anyway, we really must go. I need to get back to the shop. Yeah, of course. It was really nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Nice to meet you, Mark. It was great to see you again, Annie. Yeah, we must meet up soon. Definitely. Actually, it's Leo's birthday in a couple of weeks. Hmm. Perhaps we could meet then. OK, great. I'll give you a call. And say hello to Dan for me. So, are you good about keeping in touch with people? Uh, not really. I always plan to write to people, but then I forget. I send emails to my parents sometimes, about once a month, but more often I get emails from them saying, Are you OK? We haven't heard from you for a long time. Then I always send them a quick email and tell them what I'm doing. How about you? Oh, I like keeping in touch. I think it's important to keep in touch with your family. I write emails to my parents sometimes, but I also phone or Skype. I phone my mother every weekend. Every weekend? <laughs> yes. She gets worried about me and she wants to know what I'm doing. I hardly ever phone my parents. I wait until I go and see them and talk to them then. Don't you ever phone them to have a chat? No, I only phone if it's something important. You don't have to be in touch with people all the time. What about friends? Surely you keep in touch with friends. Not very much. Maybe I should do. I send texts or messages sometimes, but that's about all. I always think if you have good friends, you can talk about everything when you meet. It's more fun to tell people your news when you can have a real conversation. Oh, well, I often send messages to people so they know I'm thinking about them. And sometimes when I have a particularly good photo, I send it to everyone by email. I think it's a nice thing to do. 
So, the next morning we started with some water skiing practice on the beach. First, they showed us how to stand up on the skis and then how to fall off safely. The lesson took about an hour and then we were ready to go out to sea. There were five other people in my group who were all very excited, but not me. I was really worried. The instructor looked at me and said, Do you want to go first? And then everyone looked at me. Oh, I felt sick, but I said yes. Ten seconds after I started, I fell over. I tried again, and I fell over again. Then the third time, something amazing suddenly happened. I didn't fall over, and I found out that I love water skiing. The ten minutes in the water passed very quickly, and I didn't want to stop. When we got back to the hotel, the receptionist asked me, So, did you enjoy the water skiing course? I said yes, which, for the first time, was the truth. And then later on that evening, I had a drink in the bar with the other water skiers. I felt really happy. And that was when I realised I was enjoying being a yes man after all. On the last day of the holiday, I couldn't wait for midnight. At 12 o'clock, I could stop answering yes to every question. The week had been fun, but I wanted some control of my life again. That evening, I went for one last dinner with some of my new friends. So, did you have a good week? One of them asked me. Yes, I said. What was your favourite thing? She asked. And you know what? I couldn't really answer her. There were so many things I'd enjoyed. I worked as a waiter for a day. I didn't get any money for it, but I made friends with some interesting people who came to eat at the restaurant. I also spent a day fishing with five Greek fishermen and caught several fish. I stayed at a beach party until six in the morning. Oh, and I won a dancing competition. Of course... Some of my experiences weren't very good. I took the same boat trip three times. I went swimming at midnight. Actually, I liked the swimming, but I didn't like the mosquitoes that bit me when I got out of the sea. And I spent over 200 euros on souvenirs that I hate. It was great to try new things, but I was glad the week was nearly finished. I wanted to get back home and relax for a day before I started work again on Monday. But day seven wasn't finished yet. Without thinking, I asked my new friends what they planned to do next. They were all smiling at me. One of them said, We're flying to Thailand tomorrow. Do you want to come with us? You'd love it. I looked at my watch. It was 11.55. We went away on holiday for three weeks. We needed to get a visa from the embassy before we travelled. We also exchanged some money at the bank. We booked all of our accommodation online. When we arrived, we checked into our luxury hotel and unpacked our luggage. We did some sightseeing. The castles and gardens were gorgeous. We bought souvenirs for our friends and family. The second week, we checked out of our hotel and stayed in a hostel. It was cheap and friendly. The third week, we stayed on a campsite by the beach. We had a great adventure and we didn't want to come home. Well, I was in a rush that morning and I suppose I set off a bit late. 
It was raining when I left the house and there was a lot of traffic on the roads. I got to the airport just before the desk closed. When I boarded the plane, all the other passengers were waiting for me. It was a bit embarrassing, but we took off okay. I had a seat in the middle of the plane and for the first couple of hours it was fine. So I was reading my book when one of the flight attendants came over and spoke to me. She said that there was something wrong with her seat and that she needed to take mine. I was the last passenger to check in, so they chose me. I asked the flight attendant where I should sit, and she told me that the only place was the toilet. At first, I thought it was a joke, but then I realised that she was serious. So, I was sitting on the toilet when the turbulence started. It was quite frightening because, of course, there was no seat belt in the toilet. I almost fell off a few times. After the turbulence stopped, I opened the door. About five passengers were waiting outside to use the toilet. I just closed the door again. And then, to top it all, when we landed at Istanbul, there was a delay of an hour before we could get off the plane because of a problem in the airport. I still can't believe they told me to stay in the toilet for two hours. It was terrible. You just can't treat customers like that. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, how can I help you? I'm going to Birmingham to visit my brother. OK. Um, which train are you taking? Oh, I don't know. What time's the next train? The next one leaves in four minutes. How often do the trains leave? Every 30 minutes. So the next one after that is at 15.32. OK, great. And uh, which platform does it leave from? That train leaves from platform 12. So it's just over there. Sorry, just one more thing. Yes, of course. Could you tell me where the ticket office is? It's over there. But it looks quite busy. There's a long queue. I can sell you a ticket. Oh, brilliant. How much is the ticket? Well, when do you want to come back? Oh, I don't know. Probably tomorrow evening. But on Sunday, it's going to be sunny, I think. And my brother's going to have a party. And so maybe I'll stay until Monday. The ticket price has changed. Sunday is cheaper than Monday. Oh, Sunday then. <laughs> These parties are never very good. OK. You want to return to Birmingham coming back on Sunday? Yes, that's right. So that's £26.30. Can I pay by card? Yes, yeah, sure. OK, so here's your card and your ticket. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is one more thing. Where can I buy a magazine? There are news agents here. Yes, there's one just over there. Great. Thanks so much. No problem. Have a good journey. Hi. Could you tell me where the museum is, please? Yes, it's not far. It's by the river. Look on the map. Here. I see. And what time does it open? From 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. How much is a ticket? For adults, it's £14. Where can I buy a ticket? I can sell you a ticket here, or you can buy one at the museum. Oh, I'll buy one here. Can I pay by card? Of course. That's no problem. So... When I arrive in Sydney, what should I do? What time does your flight get in? At about 5 o'clock in the evening. Cool.
I finish work at six, so we can meet in the city centre. How do I get to the city centre? Look, it's really easy. There's a train from the airport and you take it to Central Station. I can meet you there. Great! I'll send you a text when I get on the train. Not long to wait now. I'm so excited. You're going to love it. I've been here for four months now and I'm having a great time. What do you like the most? Well, I mean everything. It's such a beautiful city. I'll never forget arriving in Sydney. I got here about the same time that you'll arrive, and I was pretty tired. It's a long flight from the UK. But as we were landing, the plane flew over the harbour and I saw the Opera House and Sydney Harbour Bridge. It looked just amazing. Anyway, I completely forgot that I was feeling tired. And is it just as exciting once you're actually in the city? Definitely. The thing I really love about it is the sea and the beaches. You know, I come from Birmingham and the sea is hundreds of miles away. But here in Sydney, it's all around you. Well, Lima is very near the sea. I know. But in Sydney, the harbour is such a big part of the city. You'll see. And the area of Sydney I live in is a lot of fun. There are lots of cafes and restaurants, and there's a great concert hall nearby where they play live music. I hope I can find somewhere to live easily. You will. I checked online yesterday and there were lots of adverts for housemates. That's good. And thank you for letting me stay when I arrive. No problem. I'm really looking forward to seeing you again. So, Janie, you're in town for us for the Black Friday sales season. How's it going? Yes, Harry. I'm here at the City Arcade and it is busy, busy, busy. I'm joined by two people who know all about that. Shop assistants Mike and Kathy. Mike, tell me about your day. Have you been busy? Yeah, crazy. I think this is the busiest sales day we've ever had. I've never seen crowds like this, and I've worked on sales days three times before. Like, this morning, just before we opened the doors, there was this young guy right at the front of the queue. I asked him when he got there, and he said seven o'clock last night. Wow! So he waited 13 hours in the cold. Why the big wait? Well... That's the thing. When the doors opened, I saw that he went to buy a one-pound t-shirt, and that was all. Really? No TV or computer or anything? No. Thirteen hours for a one-pound t-shirt. Just crazy. I've never known someone to do that. What about you, Kathy? Any funny stories? Tons. I've never worked on a sales day before, and I didn't know it was like this. Like, there was this one lady. She's probably the cleverest customer I've ever met. Did she get a good bargain? <laughs> it wasn't that. She was a little old lady. I saw her and I thought she looked unwell. So I got her a chair so she could sit down. And she asked me if I could get her a towel that she wanted to buy and put it in her shopping basket. 
And then she asked me to get her four cups that cost 50 pence each. I was really busy, but I got these things for her. Very kind. And then there was a shop announcement. Tablet computers just £75. And she jumped up and ran to the electronics department. So much for feeling unwell. Oh yes, she was fine and very clever. She made me do her shopping for her. Oh, and I remember there was this one guy. He wanted these really expensive jeans. There were five pairs for sale at just £25, a saving of £100. So he started queuing at about midnight last night and waited eight hours. I'm sure he wasn't alone. Well, no. So, anyway, the doors opened and he ran to the menswear department. But they were all gone. How did that happen? Well, he queued at the main door. But there's another door into the shop that is very close to the menswear department. So... Five other people got there before him. After waiting eight hours? Yeah, he had the saddest face I've ever seen. Good morning and welcome to Ways of Life, the programme where real people talk about their real lives. In today's episode, we are speaking to people who think a little differently when it comes to money. Our first guest is Daniel, who says he's learning to live with less. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, I suppose my first question is this. What exactly is living with less? What does it mean? Well, it means just giving up stuff. Things, trying to understand which things are really important. The things that we really need in life. And then saying goodbye to all the rest. And how did it all start? It was a rainy day and I just had this feeling of being, well annoyed with my life. Not angry, just not very happy. So what, you just decided to give everything away? Well, no, not quite like that. But the first thing I did was look around at all the things I had in my home. Books, sports things, all my IT equipment. And I asked myself, how often I used all those things. And really, there were only about five or six things that I used all the time. For example? Well, let's take IT. I had a desktop computer, a laptop, a tablet, a mobile phone, a video game console, all the usual things. In reality, I only used my laptop on my mobile phone. What did you do? I decided to give the other things away. Not sell them? Well, no. See, I don't need the money. So part of living with less is also learning to be generous. And just making that decision made me feel much happier, almost immediately. You say that you're learning. How's it going? Not bad. I've already given away my tablet, but I haven't found anyone who wants my desktop computer yet. It's a bit old, I suppose. <laughs> and what else are you learning? Uh, well, I'm trying to change some of the things I usually do. I've already stopped using my car. Now I take the bus or ride my bike everywhere. Have you sold your car yet? Uh, no, but I probably will. And it makes me happy to think that I'm helping the environment. Good point. And the money I normally spend on petrol, well, I give that to charity. That's great. Yeah, I've already given £25 to charity, 
a children's hospital that does research into serious diseases that affect children. It's not a lot, but it's the beginning of a process, one step at a time. What's next? Oh, we need to buy a present for Leo. Really? Why? It's his birthday, remember? And he told us last week. Well, we don't know him very well. Oh, come on. We need to buy him something. Oh, look. How about this shop? I'm sure we can find something in here. Hmm. This place is great. I could stay here all day. Well, we're only here for Leo, remember? Hi, can I help you? Uh, yes, we're looking for a present for a friend. It's his birthday. OK. Are you looking for anything in particular? Um, I don't know. Something fun. OK. What sort of thing does he like? Is he a sports fan? Yeah. Is he? Does he like sport? Yeah, I'm sure. OK. How about this? Football in a tin. Perfect for a birthday present. What is it exactly? It's a football game. Look. You put the boots on your fingers, there's a ball. This looks perfect. He loves football. Does he? I'm not sure. What else do you have? What about this? A weather station. Oh, what does it do? Well, it tells you the weather now and the next day. It's also an alarm clock. Do you have anything cheaper? Well... Well, this is a great product. A book money bank. A book money bank? Well, you open it here and there's a place to put your money to keep it safe. Well, that's quite nice. Yeah, I suppose you might like that. OK, we've decided. Great. On second thoughts, I really think we should get something sporty. Could you show us something else? Um... Oh, I know. What about this? A football clock. Brilliant. Let's get that. Well, if you really think he likes football... Yeah, of course. He was talking about football the last time we saw him. We'll take it. Was he? I don't remember that. Shona. I support Oxfam. You see, I had a really happy childhood myself. And I think it's important to help other people in poorer countries have happy childhoods. I haven't got a lot of spare money, but I try and help them in other ways. For example, last year, I ran a marathon and people sponsored me. You know, gave me money for doing the run. I made just over a hundred pounds. And then, once a month, I make cakes and take them to my office. I sell pieces of cake to my colleagues for morning tea and give the money to Oxfam. Well, giving to charity is quite easy, really. You can go online and pay with your credit card. I've given money to Greenpeace that way a few times recently, and once a year I sell their calendars, mostly to friends and the people I work with. I think that helping to save our natural world is the most important thing you can do. I think I should do something now, so that my children and my children's children can enjoy the kind of world that I live in. Of course, I think it's important to, well, that people give money to charities. But actually, I haven't got a lot of money myself. I owe money to my parents 
and I have to pay back the government for my university study and... In fact, I've never given any money to a charity. I can't really afford it. William Our history is really important and we need to protect it. When I think of all the old buildings and important cultural sites that we've already lost, it's terrible. So once every six months, I go around my neighbourhood and collect money door to door for the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation. You know, UNESCO. I tell people about all the cultural and historical places UNESCO wants to protect and how it tries to promote peace around the world. When people hear this, they are usually very interested and very generous. Marta So, Marta, what exactly is a May Ball? Well, it's a huge party at our college. They have it every summer after we finish our exams because we need to celebrate after all that stress. Everyone gets dressed up and there's food and drink and entertainment. There are eight different stages and over 70 bands. This year, one of my favourite DJs is playing. I really can't wait. What are you going to wear? I've just bought the dress I'm going to wear. It's dark blue and I feel really good in it. I'm going to wear it with high heels and some nice jewellery. Is there anything else you need to do? Get ready and sleep. I need to look my best. I'm going to the hairdressers tomorrow and a beautician is doing our makeup. Apart from that, I'm not going to leave the house on Saturday. I'm going to get as much sleep as possible. What time are you leaving? The ball doesn't start until 9 p.m., but I'm meeting the others at 7 p.m. so we can start queuing. Everyone says it takes a really long time to get in. But then we're going to stay the whole night, until 6 a.m., when they serve breakfast. Craig So, hi everyone. Welcome to today's audio blog. Well, today is the fourth day of my wedding. Everyone's going to be back here again in a few hours. There's going to be more dancing and food, of course. And today they're going to make a special cream from a spice called turmeric and rub it on my face and arms. The idea is that it cleans your skin and makes you ready for marriage. I hope it doesn't hurt. Then tomorrow is the wedding day. It starts at 9am, so quite early, but it finishes in the afternoon after lunch. My friends are arriving early tomorrow to help me get ready and take me there. I'm going to wear a traditional Indian suit called a kurta pajama. It's actually really comfortable. I'm really excited now. I'm looking forward to seeing all my friends and relatives and, of course, my new wife. But I need to be patient. The first part of an Indian wedding is breakfast with all the guests. The bride eats in a separate room with some of her friends, so I'm not going to see Monisha until the ceremony actually begins later in the morning. Hello. Hi, Harry. It's me. I'm here. I've just arrived at my hotel. Welcome to Tokyo. Did you have a good journey? Yeah, it was fine. I was so lucky to get a stopover in Japan. And lucky that I'm here to show you around. I've already got a few ideas about what we can do. Great. But I really don't want to go where all the tourists go. I want to see the real Tokyo. Okay, so we won't go to Disneyland then. And I won't take you to the Imperial Palace either. Okay. 
I mean, the palace is nice, but it's so crowded. It's really just a place for tourists. Fine. So, shall we start with something to eat? That sounds good. There's a great noodle restaurant I know. The noodles are delicious. Some of the best in Tokyo. And it's also really simple. You just eat quickly and then you leave. So we won't waste any time. Brilliant. After that, I'll take you to Yoyogi Park. It's a huge park, and it'll be really busy at the moment because everyone's going to see the cherry blossom. The cherry blossom? Yeah, it's beautiful. You see young people, businessmen in suits, families. Everyone goes to look at the pretty flowers. There are also lots of musicians there. And there are festivals almost every week where you can learn, eat, and drink. And after that? Well, do you want to do any shopping? Actually, yes. I want to look for a new camera. Excellent. I'll take you to Akihabara then. There are lots of electronic shops there, and they often have special offers. Perfect. And what are we doing in the evening? I've already booked a room for karaoke. Really? I don't really like karaoke that much. I'm a terrible singer. Yes, but you haven't tried karaoke Japanese style. I've booked a private room for six people. So you, me, and four of my friends. You'll love them. They're really good fun. Anyway, I've booked it until 3 a.m. 3 a.m.? Remember, my flight leaves at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Don't worry. You won't miss your flight. I promise. Anyway, we won't be finished at 3. After that, we're going to the Toyusu Fish Market. A fish market? In the early hours of the morning? Yeah, it's the best time to go. They bring in all the fish they've just caught. Trust me. It's an amazing sight. Okay. This is going to be an interesting day. So, shall I come to your hotel in about an hour? Okay. See you in a bit. Bye. Haneda Airport, please. Okay. Oof. Are you tired? Yes. And I'm a bit worried about my flight. It leaves in two hours. Don't worry. You'll be fine. It only takes half an hour to get there. We've got plenty of time. Hmm. So, what was your favorite part of the day? Difficult question. I liked all of it. The food was great. The fish market. Well, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. But I think I like the karaoke best. It's such good fun in a private room. I hate it in England where you sing in front of 50 strangers. Yeah, absolutely. Can you ask the taxi driver to go a bit faster? I'm really worried about this flight. Yeah, he is a bit slow. Can you go a bit faster, please? This is a nightmare now. The flight leaves in an hour. Yes, I'm really sorry about this. We stayed too long at the fish market, and I didn't know there'd be so much traffic. Mm. Look, I've got an idea. You enjoyed your day, didn't you? Definitely. Well, until now, anyway. Well, change your flight and stay another day. I'll take the day off work. There are lots more places in Tokyo I want to show you. I don't know. What about the flight? You can change the flight. Come on, it'll be great. Yeah, but... Come on. Shall I tell the taxi driver to turn round? Well... Hello, fantastic flowers. Oh, hi. Rachel? Yes? It's Annie. Oh, hi, Annie. How are you? I'm OK, thanks. You? I'm great. Listen, you know it's Leo's birthday this week? Of course. Well, are you doing anything on Wednesday? Would you like to come round for a meal? Oh, that sounds nice. 
I'll just check. Um, no, we can't do Wednesday, sorry. We're meeting some friends. Oh, okay. How about Thursday? Is that okay for you? Thursday, hang on a minute. Oh, no, sorry, I'm working on Thursday evening. Oh. This week's really busy for us. Next week? Okay. What are you doing on Monday? Just a moment. Nothing. We can do Monday. Perfect. Great. What time should we come round? Let's say seven o'clock. Okay. And would you like us to bring anything? No, nothing. See you on Monday then. Great. See you then. Bye. was great. Yeah, thanks, Annie. You're a great cook. Thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Enjoyed it? I don't think I can move. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for a moment. I think I need to go for a run tomorrow. I always tell you not to eat so much. Rachel, can you come here for a second? I need you to help me carry something. I'll send Mark. He needs the exercise. Go on. I think I need to get some exercise as well. Mark said you're a big sports fan. No, not really. I mean, I like to keep fit, so I go to the gym, but I don't really like sport. It's a bit boring. <laughs> and I can't stand football. Oh. Happy birthday, Leo! Happy, Happy birthday! <laughs> Thanks, everyone. What an amazing cake. Oh, we've got this for you, Leo. Yes. Happy birthday. <laughs> you really didn't need to. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's great. I love it. That's very kind of you. <laughs> I knew you'd like it. Actually, Leo, I was thinking, since you're a sports fan, maybe we could do something together sometime. Maybe go to a football match. Well, sure. Or how about a workout? I like going to the gym. How about that? Do you want to come with me sometime? Oh. OK. Why not? The gym sounds great. When are you free? I normally go in the evening. Well, are you going next Tuesday? I'm free then. Uh, I can't Tuesday. How about Thursday? OK, sounds great. Susanna. I don't really like having a party at home to celebrate. It's too much work. I think it's better to go out together and find a nice place where you can celebrate. Then you can all have a good time together. This weekend, it's my 21st birthday and we're going to book a function room at a hotel and have a big party there. All my friends are coming and we're going to have a band and a DJ. Everyone's going to look their best. All the men are going to wear suits and I'm going to buy a new dress. I'm really excited about it. Barbara I like inviting friends to my home, but I'm not a very good cook. I always get very stressed if I have to cook meals for people. Everyone else is having a nice time, but I'm just worrying if the food's OK, so I don't really enjoy it. What I do like is if we all cook something together, or if everyone makes something and brings it. I think that makes it more relaxed. We're doing that on Saturday. We're having a barbecue, but I'm just making some salads, and I'm going to ask everyone to bring something for the barbecue. I'm looking forward to it. Sven I sometimes enjoy parties, but they're all the same really. You just sit around and 
talk to people about all the usual stuff until it's time to go home. With friends, I think it's better to do something together, then you don't get bored. Like going to the cinema or bowling maybe, or going out somewhere nice together. This weekend I'm going to the countryside with some old friends I haven't seen for a long time. We're going to a lake to swim and have a picnic together, and maybe we'll play volleyball. That'll be fun. Alicia This is such a cool job because I get to do the thing I love most every day. I wasn't very good at schoolwork, probably because I spent too much time gaming. But I was good at art and drawing. When I was about 16, I met someone who was already working as a video game designer, and he told me that it's difficult to get a job. You have to have good exam results and a good degree. So, I did an extra maths course at school, and I also learned some computer programming. This meant I got onto a degree course to study game design. After I graduated, it still took me a year to find my dream job. Before that, I had a boring job as an IT worker in a company that sold software for accountants. But it was worth the wait. I really enjoy creating characters and stories for games. It's amazing fun. Jason I always wanted a job where I could teach people new things, practical things, not the kind of things you have to study. When I left school, I started learning how to be an electrician, but I didn't like my boss. I tried being a plumber, but that was boring. Then I found out that I can mix teaching with the other thing I love doing in life, getting on my skateboard and going around town. I love that feeling of freedom as you move quickly and easily among people and cars. I started working as an instructor about five years ago. You don't have to have a degree or any other qualification, but I found a course and I got a certificate. It's important because there are a lot of safety things you need to think about when you're an instructor. For example, my students can't have a lesson if they aren't wearing a helmet. It's a really amazing job. Really cool. Megan For a couple of years, I worked for a bank, first as an accountant and then in client services. But I hated my job. <laughs> Too much stress. Then I saw this advert for an amazing job. It was like an escape. So for the past year, I've lived alone on this island where it's so peaceful and quiet. I love it. It's not the kind of job that just anyone can do. You have to be the kind of person who likes being alone. And you have to be practical. You know, good at fixing things yourself. But you don't need any experience or training. And another thing, every day is like a work day. You can't really have a day off because there's always something to do. Some gardening or cleaning or something. But you don't have to do the same thing every day. It's always different. Oh, it's so relaxing here, and the island is so beautiful. Are you enjoying the careers fair? It's not bad. It's good to meet people from different companies. Are you looking for work at the moment? Yes, but it won't be easy to find a job I'll enjoy. There just aren't enough jobs. You have to take what you can find. 
I applied for a job this week, but I don't think I'll get an interview. They won't be interested in me because I don't have any experience. Are you enjoying the fair today? Yeah, it's great. I'm sure I'll make some really useful contacts. There are people from some really interesting companies here. And are you applying for jobs at the moment? Yes. I don't think it'll take long to find work. You never know, I might get a job today. I know someone who found a job at an event like this last year. Are you enjoying it today? Yes, it's good. It's useful because I'm not sure what kinds of jobs I'm interested in. So, are you looking for work at the moment? Not yet. I'm still studying and then I'll try to get some work experience when I finish my course. After that, I can start looking for a job. I might not get my perfect job because not many people do straight out of university. And how do you feel about that? Well, I just need to pay the bills, you know. I'm sure I'll find some kind of work because I'm happy to do anything they'll pay me for. I can work my way up. I've got time. Oh dear. Is everything okay? I'm not sure, really. I've just got a text message from my friend Annie. Do you remember her? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, she says she's had some bad news and she needs to talk to me. Oh dear. I hope she's okay. Hmm. I'd better give her a ring. Or maybe I should go and see her. Yeah, maybe you should. I'll finish things here if you want. But I can't leave you here on your own. I'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But we've still got so much to do. Oh, it doesn't matter. Honestly, I'll be OK. I don't want to leave you with too much work. It doesn't seem very fair. It means you won't be able to leave early today. Oh, never mind. Look, why don't you tell me what we still need to do and I'll write a list. Then you can go and see Annie. OK, well, if you're sure... Of course. It's no problem. Well... <sighs> right. And after that... Shall I finish off those flowers? The ones you were doing? OK, that would be great. And would you like me to prepare some of the orders for tomorrow? Yeah. You could start with that order for Mrs. Thompson because she's picking it up early. OK. And then maybe you should start on the order for that big birthday party. OK. Actually, no. We can do that tomorrow morning. We'll have time. Yeah, fine. OK. I think that's everything. Oh, when you leave, you'll need to put the alarm on. I'll write down the code for you. OK. Oh. Do you want me to take out the rubbish when I leave? Um, no, don't worry. The bag's not full yet. I'll do it tomorrow. OK. Fine. OK, great. I'll text Annie to say I'm coming. Oh, how about taking her some flowers? That'll cheer her up. Good idea. Hello, how can I help? Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanted to make an order for some flowers. Of course. What would you like? Well, actually, it's for my daughter's wedding. Oh. So, um, some red roses. Yep. Uh, some white roses. Mm hmm Some lilies. Rachel, why don't I deal with this? Are you sure? Yes, just go. OK. Bye. Right. Bye. Uh, so that was some red roses? Uh, three dozen, please.
Are you working this summer? Yeah, I've got a job in a cafe, same as last year. How about you? I don't know. I usually work in a supermarket, but I don't like it much. It's so tiring, and you have to start really early in the morning. I might look for a different job this summer. What's working in a cafe like? Oh, it's good. It gets quite busy, so you need to be good at working really fast. But I like that. Well, that's the same as a supermarket. Yeah, but it's good fun too. You're working in a team, and you meet lots of people. It's great. Is the pay good? Not bad, and you can sometimes make quite a lot from tips. Really? How much do you make in tips? It depends. I can sometimes make twenty pounds in one day. Wow, that sounds good. <laughs> It's not always that much, though. Listen, why don't you apply for a job? I'm sure they'll give you one. They're always looking for new people. Yeah, I don't know. I've never worked in a cafe. I don't know anything about it. Oh, that doesn't matter. They'll give you training. You don't need to know anything. Really? No. You just have to smile a lot and be nice to people. It's easy. Hmm. Okay. What are they called? Cuba Coffee Company. They've got a website. Okay. Thanks. I'll have a look tomorrow. Update my CV and apply. Great. Good luck. Don't borrow money from friends because it creates problems. Only spend money on things you really need. Don't pay for friends' meals when you go out. You should wait for the sales to buy expensive things. You should ask for a few days off. Talk to a doctor about how you feel. You should think of ways to save energy. Eat a good breakfast so you arrive at work or school full of energy. Magda was annoyed by the music from the neighbor's flat. The music from the neighbor's flat was really annoying. Will's birthday present was very disappointing. Will was very disappointed by his present. Andreas was very confused by the road sign. The road signs were really confusing. Sarah was tired after a long day at work. Sarah had a really tiring day at work. Mehmet thought the animals were frightening. Mehmet was frightened of the animals. The fireworks looked amazing. Everyone was amazed by the fireworks. Liza was embarrassed by her boyfriend's dancing. Liza's boyfriend's dancing was embarrassing. Anita was surprised to get the news from her sister. Anita got some surprising news from her sister. The price of the meal was shocking. They were shocked when they got the bill for the meal. So what did you do? Well, I was really confused. I thought I was going to die. I didn't really know what to do. I just wanted to get out of the water. But then I saw a shark, then another and another, and suddenly I stopped feeling frightened. I forgot about dying, 
and watch those amazing fish moving through the water. Seeing those sharks probably saved my life because they made me feel relaxed. I started breathing better and very slowly I made my way to the top. And how did you feel when you got back to the surface? Well, once we were back on the fishing boat, I felt a lot of different things. I was happy to be alive, but I was also embarrassed because I used most of my air. And I was shocked and angry with my instructor for taking me down to 40 metres and then disappearing. And how has the whole experience changed you? After that experience, every time I tried to dive, I got really worried. In the end, I stopped scuba diving. I still love sharks, but I'll never go that deep again to see them. So, Aaron, your story is pretty amazing. What happened to you? Well, I think I'm very lucky to be alive today. I was pulled along under a plane when we were flying at a height of 6,000 metres. Wow! That's unbelievable! How did it happen? So, there were three people in the plane that day. Me and two other jumpers, Monica and Ben. I wasn't an experienced parachute jumper at the time. I had only done about 15 jumps. So what went wrong? Well, Monica told me I should go first. I stood up and put my foot outside the plane door, but then the wind pushed me to the side. I was stuck, flat against the side of the plane. I tried to push myself away, but it didn't work. Then, part of my parachute got stuck on the plane. I couldn't move my leg, so I couldn't fall. I was hanging under the plane, hanging from my parachute, and there was nothing I could do. The others couldn't see me. The plane was just pulling me along in the sky, and nobody knew I was there. That sounds terrifying. How did you feel? Obviously, I was very frightened. I knew how dangerous it was. I knew I could die if I hit the back of the plane. So, did the others help you? At first, they didn't know I was there. But when Monica was getting ready to jump, she saw me and shouted, Aaron's under the plane! The pilot slowed the plane down and they freed my parachute. When I started to fall, I felt better, but when I landed, I was shocked to think about what had happened. Did that experience stop you from jumping? No, but I realised how serious it was. Because I jumped first, Monica saw me and saved me. But if I had been the last one to jump, I would have died, because the pilot couldn't have saved me while he was flying the plane. Hi, Annie. Oh, hi, Rachel. Thanks for coming. That's OK. Here, I brought you some flowers. Oh, thank you. They're lovely. Oh! That's OK. What's happened? It's work. My boss asked to see me this afternoon and she told me I'm going to lose my job. Oh, how awful. I'm really sorry to hear that. Did she say why? She just said the company's having problems. That's terrible. Yeah. Anyway, I'll make some tea. So, what happened when you talked to your boss? Did you ask when you're going to lose your job? Or if it's completely certain? No. I didn't say much. I was too upset. Of course you were. I didn't really ask anything. What do you think I should do? OK. Well, I'd get all the details first. Right. 
so I think you should speak to your boss again. Maybe there'll be other jobs there. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't know if I want to stay. Lots of people are unhappy there. And I don't think there are any other jobs anyway. Okay, but I think it's a good idea to ask. You don't know what she'll say. I suppose so. And why don't you speak to some of the people you work with? Ask them what they're doing. Hmm. I don't think I should do that. My boss told me not to talk to anyone else because other people are going to lose their jobs too. Hmm. You work in marketing, right? Yeah. Well, Mark works in marketing too. His company's often looking for new people. Really? Do you think I should speak to him about it? Definitely. I'll speak to him too. Okay. Great. And I wouldn't worry too much. Changing jobs could be a good thing. You'll have the chance to do something new. Yeah. You're right. Is that everything, Annie? Has something else happened? No. It's stupid. Oh, come on, you can tell me. Well, it's just... I called Leo to talk about my job, but he didn't answer the phone. I sent him a text, but he still hasn't replied. Well, don't worry. I'm sure he'll call you soon. Yeah. Maybe he's not interested in me anymore. <sighs> I don't know. <sighs> you shouldn't worry. He's probably just busy at work. You're right. You're right. Everything will be fine. Call Mark tomorrow. I'll tell him what's happened when he comes home tonight. Okay. And I'm sure Leo will ring you soon. Thanks, Rachel. For your help. That's okay. That's what friends are for. Chloe. The problem is that I think about my job even in my free time. I'm so busy during the day, I don't have time to think. And then when I get home, I spend all my time thinking and worrying. You see, my old boss had to leave in a hurry, a family problem, and they gave me his job. But I haven't had any training, and I don't feel ready to be a manager and make decisions. Friends tell me I should do something relaxing after work, like go for a walk on the beach. But I still can't stop thinking about meetings I've been to or meetings I'll have to go to the next day. And all the reports I have to write. There's so much to do and I just feel so stressed. Bob At first, I was excited about doing something new. I've never done anything like this before. Well, I'm sorry to say I've stopped feeling excited. I'm just generally confused. I don't feel like I'm improving at all. The thing is, my wife is Polish, and I want to be able to speak to people in her family when we go to Poland. I wasn't very good at languages at school. I mean, I learnt a little bit of French, and that was quite hard. But I find Polish really difficult. My wife says, don't worry, when we go to Poland, you'll really start to learn. But to be honest, I'm not so sure. I don't think I'm the kind of person who can just listen to a language and learn it. Marissa 
I feel really tired because I haven't been sleeping well for the past week. I stay up late most nights and drink coffee to stay awake. I read the books on my book list and the notes I've made during the year again and again. And I test myself all the time to help me remember information. My parents tell me I should take more breaks. They forget that I didn't do very well in my exams last year and I was very disappointed with my results. I really want to do well this year, so I need to do all this work. So I think I'm just going to have to continue like this until I'm sure that I can remember everything. Stephen Adams The subject of this week's One Minute Inspiration is New Zealand basketball player Stephen Adams. Stephen's mother is from the South Pacific island of Tonga and his father was English. Stephen has 17 brothers and sisters and he's the youngest. Stephen's childhood was happy but that happiness ended suddenly when his father died. Stephen was 13 years old. He found it very hard to accept his father's death and he felt that he didn't have someone to guide him in his life. Stephen started missing school. At first, it was just one day a week, but it quickly became a regular thing. He was also lying to his family about missing school. He spent his days on the streets of Rotorua, a small city in the north of New Zealand and he began to get friendly with young men in a local gang. Very soon, it looked like Stephen was going to have a future of crime. Stephen's older brother, Warren, decided to take action. He took Stephen to live with him in Wellington, the capital city of New Zealand, away from his troubled life in Rotorua. He found a place for Stephen in a basketball academy where the coach organised a sports scholarship for him at a private school. The rule was that Stephen had to come to every basketball training session and he couldn't miss school. In the beginning, Stephen found it very hard to stick to these rules. But soon he found that the routine helped him let go of the anger he felt as a result of his father's death. He worked hard, his basketball skills improved, and he graduated from high school. In June 2012, he got an offer of a place from the Pittsburgh Panthers, a college basketball team in the USA. The next year, he turned professional and joined the Oklahoma City Thunder team. He is now a top NBA player and gets paid more than $20 million a year. And a comic book has been written about his life. He's come a long way from his unhappy teenage life. Selena Gomez One Minute Inspiration this week looks at the life of a multi-talented young woman. She's an actress, a singer, a fashion designer, a TV producer, and she does a lot of work for charity. Selena Gomez is now rich and famous, but it wasn't always like that for her. Her childhood was difficult, and she was poor. Selena's parents got divorced when she was five years old and she stayed with her mother. The divorce was very hard on Selena, who only wanted to be part of a normal family. Selena's mother was an actress, but she found it hard to get work so she had very little money. Sometimes the only food they could afford was tinned spaghetti that they bought at the dollar store. They had to look for coins when they wanted to pay for petrol to put in the car. Although she had little money, Selena's mother worked hard and always supported her daughter. 
As a child, Selina watched her mother work in the entertainment industry, and at a young age she decided this was what she wanted to do too. Her mother was her inspiration. Many people think Selina was discovered in 2007 with the Disney hit production Wizards of Waverly Place, but she had already been working for five years before in children's TV programs like Barney and Friends. During those first years, Selina got support from her mother, who gave up her own career to focus on Selina's. With Wizards of Waverly Place, Selina and her mother moved to Hollywood, and she started to get really busy. She was offered roles in films as well as a pop music recording contract. She now divides her time between acting and singing. She has also become a TV producer and is very active in charity work. So, despite her difficult beginnings, she has become a rich and successful woman, and it's all thanks to the support of her family and her ability to work hard and face challenges. I would love to get a job as a designer, but for now, I'll take any work. You could work as a waiter until you get an offer from a design company. I've got a terrible cold at the moment. It's strange. I hardly ever get ill. Oh dear. I hope you get better soon. How's the new job? It's great. I really get on well with my new colleagues. But I don't get paid for the first month, so I can't afford to go out for a while. Ted studied hard at school and got a place at university. While he was there, he got to know Sylvia, another student on his course. They didn't see each other after university, but one day Ted saw Sylvia's photo in a newspaper and decided to get in touch with her again. They soon got together and were a very happy couple. Just six months later, they decided they wanted to spend their lives together, so they got engaged. But the story didn't end well. Only a year after the wedding, they got divorced. What? I have problems walking upstairs these days. I really need to get fit. I often have sleeping problems. The next day, the lack of sleep makes me feel exhausted. In my family, we have a low cholesterol diet. I don't think we'll ever suffer from heart disease. When I joined my gym, I got a fitness program from a trainer. They all work 10 to 12 hours a day, and they all suffer from stress. We are allergic to nuts and eggs. We get ill if we eat them. I have a healthy diet, but sometimes I eat food that's bad for me, like chips or chocolate. He stayed inside all summer and suffered from a lack of vitamin D. I don't want to put on weight, so I walk to work each day to keep in shape. Mr Seymour? Yes? Dr Evans is ready to see you. Thank you. Come in. Please, take a seat. So, what's the problem? Well, 
My back hurts. It's very painful and I can't get to sleep. I see. And when did this problem start? About three or four days ago. Hmm. And where does it hurt? Could you show me? Here, this area. Can I have a look? Sure. Have you had any accidents recently? No. And you haven't hurt your back in any way? Playing sport, that kind of thing? No, no, nothing. Hmm. Okay. I'm quite worried about it. It hurts all the time. When I walk, when I sit down. I spent the last few days in bed and I feel exhausted. Okay, well, I don't think it's anything to worry about. Phew. That's good to hear. Okay, well, I don't think it's anything to worry about. Phew. That's good to hear. But you shouldn't stay in bed. That's not going to help. Oh dear, really? No. Try to do all the things you normally do, but gently. And don't stay in the same position for a long time. Maybe go for a short walk. OK, that sounds fine. Do you do any exercise? Well, I usually go to the gym, but I haven't been recently. I'm very busy at work at the moment and I just don't have the time. I see. And do you spend a lot of time sitting down at work? Yes, I do. I work in an office, so I spend a lot of time at my computer. Right. It's really important, if you spend a lot of time at a desk in an office, to take regular breaks. And you'll need to start doing exercise again. When you feel ready. OK. Breaks, exercise, fine. Are you taking anything for the pain? Uh, yes, I've taken some aspirin. OK, good. And do you have any allergies? No, I don't think so. Good. Well, I'll give you a prescription for something a bit stronger. OK, that's great. Take these, but only when you need them, after food. No more than two every four hours. Right. And don't take any more than eight in a 24-hour period. Fine. And come back again in a week's time if it doesn't improve. I expect you'll feel a lot better by then anyway. OK, thanks very much. I really don't think it's anything to worry about. <laughs> what a relief. Bye. Bye now. My name's Jenny Jackson. And today, we're talking about how to change your life. In the studio with us today, we have three people who have made changes in their lives. Jeff, Sylvia and Luca. Hi, guys. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. So, first of all, Jeff, can you tell us what your problem was? Why did you need to make a change? Well, one day I suddenly realized that if I wanted to buy a new car or my own apartment, I needed to save some money. I see. Why didn't you have any money? Well, I used to spend a lot of money on things that I didn't really need. So, for example, I used to go out for dinner at a restaurant at least four times a week. I loved getting new things, like, you know, the latest phone, clothes. One weekend, I sat down and added up the money I'd spent in a month. I was shocked. I can imagine. So, what have you changed? Well, now I eat at home most of the time. And I think, do I need this before I buy something new? I've saved almost 5,000 pounds. I'm really pleased with myself. Cool, that's great. Next up, we have Sylvia. Sylvia, tell us about your change. Hi, Jenny. Well, my story began when one day I had to walk up a hill. 
When I got to the top, it was difficult to breathe. I was so unfit. The problem is I really hate most kinds of exercise. You know, running, cycling, swimming. Then this friend said, why don't you come to a dance class? The first time was so hard I had to sit down and rest, but, but I enjoyed it. So I went back again and again. And very slowly I'm getting fitter and losing weight. I climbed that hill again last week. Easy. <laughs> That's great, Sylvia. I really need to get fit myself. <laughs> Anyhow, last up we have Luca. Hi, Luca. Hi. So, Luca, what did you need to change? Well, about six months ago, I realised that I had a very small number of friends. But if I thought back, well, seven, eight years ago, I used to have a lot of friends. And I asked myself, why is that? Well, some of them got married and had children, and their lives sort of went in another direction. And a couple of friends got job offers overseas. But when I thought about it a bit more, well, another answer was, I'm a bit lazy. Lazy about keeping in touch with people. I see. So, what did you do about it? So, I started to get in touch with my old friends. And then, after that, I had to stay in contact and arrange to meet them again. Now I find that people call me. And the great thing is, we still enjoy the things that we used to. Well, thanks so much, guys, for sharing your story with us. It just shows that we can all make that change if we decide to do it. Hello and welcome to Superfans, the program where we talk to sports fans about their heroes and ask them one difficult question. The winners get tickets to see their hero play. So, let's get started and meet our first fan. Who do we have on the phone? Michael. Michael Stewart. Hi there, Michael. How are you feeling? Good. Good. A little nervous. Don't worry. Now, what's your sport, Michael? Football. Are you a fan or a player? Well, uh, both, really. That's great. Have you always been into football? Yes. I've been a fan for about 20 years. And do you play? Oh, yes. I've played with my local team for about ten years now. Good for you, Michael. So tell me, who's your sports hero? Well, obviously, he's a football player. But maybe not one you'd expect. It's Andy Robertson. Andy Robertson? All right. Why is he your hero? Well, first of all, he's a great player. I got to know him when he joined Liverpool. They've been my favourite team since I was a kid. And he's such an energetic player. He gets up and down the pitch throughout the whole match. He's so determined to win. What else do you like about him? Well, he's had a really interesting career. He started at a small team in Scotland, but he didn't get paid, and he had no money. So he worked really hard to improve his game. He moved from team to team until he got his dream move to Liverpool. Now he tries to give something back, so he does a lot of charity work. And do you know the other teams he played for before Liverpool? 
Is that my competition question? No, not quite. But do you know the answer? Of course. Well, his first team, I think that was Queen's Park. And he played for Hull City. I think there was another team, but I forget who it was. Yes, that's what it says here. The other team was... Dundee United. So, Michael, now it is time for your competition question. Are you ready? Ready. What I want to know is this. Which team was Andy Robertson a big fan of as a boy? Oh, that's easy. It was Scotland. Scotland? That's your answer. Oh, Michael, I'm so sorry. That's not the right answer. It says here he was a big fan of Celtic. Celtic? Ah, that's right. I thought you meant the country he was a fan of. Mm, that's a good point. I suppose he was a fan of Celtic and Scotland. You know what, Michael? I'm going to give it to you. You've won the tickets. What? That's amazing. Thank you so much. No problem. Just stay on the phone and our producer will take your details. OK, so it's time to have a break. We'll be back soon with our second contestant, Kelly White from Manchester. Welcome back, everyone. OK, now we should have Kelly on the line. Hi, Kelly. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. OK, great. Now, can you tell us what your sport is? It's football. For men and women? Yeah, sort of. But I'm more interested in women's football. So do you play? I used to play at university. You know, friendly games and all that. Nothing serious. So you'd say you're more of a fan? Oh, yeah, a huge fan. When did you get into the sport? Well, I've always enjoyed women's football, but I've only been a really big fan since 2019. Why since then? That's when I saw Sam Kerr play for Australia in the World Cup. So I became a football fan and a Sam Kerr fan at the same time. Oh, yes, I remember the match against Jamaica when Kerr scored four goals in a row. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So why do you like Sam Kerr so much? Well, I just love the fact that she scores so many goals. She's a really skillful, a really exciting player to watch. In my opinion, she's more exciting than a lot of male football players. And what else? Well, her personality, I think. The way she helps younger players and also... She's just a really nice, modest kind of person. In interviews, she always says how much her parents helped her or her teammates. It's never about herself. I really like that. Yes, she's a fantastic role model. Yeah. Do you know when she started playing football? Yes, when she was 15, wasn't it? No. It was actually when she was 12. She started playing international football at 15. Oh, no! Did I just lose the competition? No, no, don't worry. I'm going to ask you the competition question now. <sighs> oh, <laughs> OK. Tell me, Sam Kerr's father played football. 
But what sport did her mother play? Um, oh, I know it wasn't football. Uh, was it volleyball? You're very close. Not volleyball, though. Oh, basketball. You got it right. Oh, with a bit of help. <laughs> oh, well, you know. You're still a winner. Stay on the line, Kelly, and our producer will take your details. Hi, Annie. Oh, hi. Are you busy? Can I come in? Uh, yeah, come in. Do you want anything to drink? A coffee? No, no, I'm fine. So, how are you? I'm... Well, I'm OK. Look, I'm really sorry I haven't called you. It doesn't matter. No, look, let me explain. I couldn't call or send you a message. I've had a really bad back. I was in bed for days. What do you mean you couldn't call? Did your arm stop working? How hard is it to call someone? No, no, you don't understand. I was going to call you, but I couldn't find my mobile. I don't know, Leo. How can I believe you? It's true. I thought you were avoiding me. No, of course not. So, what happened? Did you have an accident? No, nothing. I just woke up one day and it was hurting. And then every day it got worse. Oh. So in the end I went to the doctor. And what did the doctor say? Well, he said it's because I'm always behind my desk in the office. I was worried, you know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you worry. And then I meant to call you after I went to the doctor, but I was working so much. Well, it's not your fault. But why were you working so much? Well, because I miss so much work. Because of my back. Leo, the doctor said you had a bad back because of your work. And then you work even more. I know, I know. I had to work that much. I didn't have a choice. Oh, Leo. I'm sorry, Annie. Don't worry about it. No, there's no excuse. No, really. It's fine. Are you sure you don't want that coffee? Oh. That would be great. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, is it hurting now? A bit. Did the doctor give you anything? Yeah, he gave me some pills. They're helping, but not much. Oh, I know. Lie down and I'll walk on your back. What? <laughs> I saw it on a TV programme. It'll help. Annie, I don't really think that's for serious back problems. Uh, no, of course not. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's just, you know, I think I should do what the doctor says. Well, you could come to my yoga class. I think yoga's really good for your back. Mmm, yoga. I'm not sure. Come on, you'll love it. Do any other men go? Well, no. But you could be the first. <laughs> it's not really my kind of thing. They do water aerobics, too, in the swimming pool. <laughs> Annie, that sounds worse than yoga. Well, what about the gym? I know. You can go with Mark. He asked you, remember? You should call him. What do you think? Yeah, I suppose. Call him. It'll be fun. OK, OK. I will. 
I promise. I'm reading a book called How I Met Myself. I've had this book for about a year, but I only started reading it last week. It's about a man who lives in Budapest, Hungary. One day, as he's going home from work, a man suddenly appears and knocks him over in the street. He sees that the man looks exactly like him. He's his double. But the double runs away before the man can say anything. He thinks this is very strange and he decides to try and find the man. However, he's afraid people will think he's crazy, so he doesn't tell anyone about it, not even his wife. I don't know what's going to happen in the end, but I'm really enjoying it. I usually read it on the bus on the way to work. I'm reading a very good book at the moment. It's fiction, but I think it's based on a true story. It's called Eye of the Storm, and it's about a hurricane, a very strong storm, which is coming towards the coast of Florida in the USA. The main characters in the story are a man and his daughter and her friend. And the man is out in his fishing boat and he hasn't heard about the hurricane. So his daughter and her friend have to go out to sea and try to tell him before it's too late. It's very exciting. I can't stop reading it. I'm not reading anything at the moment, but I've just finished a book called Apostle for Logan. It's a crime story and it happens in Edinburgh in Scotland. It's a murder mystery. The police have found a woman who was murdered and at the same time a man has just escaped from prison. He's been in prison for six years and he knows the woman, so of course everyone thinks that he murdered her. But the police officer, Inspector Logan, doesn't believe it. So he tries to find out who really murdered the woman. It's a good story. I liked it. My brother was always the ambitious one in the family, and he really wanted to get into university. His dream was to do a degree in physics because he wanted to become a scientist. He studied hard at school and he managed to get a place at a top university, St Andrews. University was hard, but he enjoyed it. He had to write a lot of essays, but he was a good student. He always took a lot of notes during his classes and he only handed an essay in late once because he had a broken leg and was in hospital. Because of his hard work, he got good marks for all his courses and he never failed an exam. He was an A-plus student. And what about me? Well, that's a different story. I'm writing an essay at the moment, but I'm a bit worried because I only started today and I have to hand it in on Friday. I really need to speak to my lecturer. I might fail the year if she doesn't give me more time. I can't believe it's all over. The last exam was yesterday. Now I just have to wait for the results. I studied hard, so I'm quite confident. If I pass, I'm going to have a big party. If I don't, well, I'm not going to think about that. So I've got my results and I'm really happy with my marks. All those hours in the library paid off. The problem now is that I have to choose which course to do at which university. I've got three places to choose from and they're all really good, but they're slightly different. I have to be quick. If I don't decide soon, I'll miss the deadline.
Well, my exam starts next week, so I'm revising a lot at the moment. I really want to do an economics degree, but it won't be easy to get a place. There are a lot of people who want one. But I'm sure I'll get the marks I need if I work hard. The exam's in a couple of hours. I'm not really ready because I went to a few parties this week and I haven't had time to revise. If the questions aren't too hard, I might be okay. But this lecturer normally gives us difficult exam papers, so I think I'm in trouble. So let's have a look at another story in the news today. A study reported in the newspapers this week has found that 50% of people in the USA say they are shy and also that this is an increase and shyness is becoming more common. Well, here to talk about this is Dr. Lamb from the University of South London. Dr. Lamb, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me here. Let's talk first about shyness in general. Obviously, we all feel shy sometimes. When does it become a problem? Well, it becomes a problem when it stops you doing what you want to do. Shy people normally want to communicate with other people. They don't want to be on their own, but they find it difficult when they need to talk to other people or when people talk to them. OK. And is it true that people are becoming shyer? Is shyness becoming more common in the world? That's a difficult question to answer. But some people say that modern technology is making us shyer. Yes, in fact, the study mentions technology. What is the relationship between technology and shyness? Yes, well, the idea is basically that we speak to other people much less now because of technology. The internet has changed things a lot. We maybe use email or Facebook more than we talk on the phone or meet our friends. We check our bank account online. We don't go to the bank much anymore and speak to someone. We book our holidays online, not at a travel agent's. So there are all these things. We just speak to other people less than in the past. So when we do speak to someone, it's more difficult for us. Mm. So tell us, what makes shy people feel the way they do? What's going on in a shy person's head? Well, first, it's important to say everyone is different, so there's no single answer. But in general, shy people worry a lot and they expect things to go wrong. Let's imagine a shy person wants to go to a party. He or she will probably make lots of predictions about the party, normally bad ones. So they'll say... If I go to the party, I won't know anyone and it will be difficult. I won't enjoy it and so on. Or often they imagine terrible situations. Um, everyone will laugh when I speak. Everyone will hate me. That kind of thing. These are, I think, the kinds of feelings we all get sometimes. But you're saying that very shy people get more of them. Yes, yes, absolutely. And what can you do to help shy people? Well, when I work with shy people, I ask them to talk about these feelings. I tell them to make a list of all the things they worry about. Then I can ask, well, do you think these things will really happen? At the beginning, they say yes. But I work with them and I hope in the end, they'll realise the things probably won't happen. That's important. And after this training, I ask the shy person to go out and speak to people to see what happens. And normally, nothing bad happens. Then they can compare this real experience they've had to the list of fears they wrote on day one. There's normally a big difference, and this really helps them to deal with their shyness. 
Okay, Dr. Lamb, we have to finish there. Thanks for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Good morning, Turner and Collins. Oh, good morning. Is it possible to speak to Mark Riley in marketing? I'll just put you through. Hello, Mark Riley's phone. Oh, hello. Is Mark there? I'm afraid he's not available. He's in a meeting. Can I take a message? Um, can you just tell him that I called? And who's calling, please? This is Annie Morton speaking. OK, and shall I ask him to call you back? Uh, yes, please. Did you say your name was Annie Morgan? No, sorry, Annie Morton. That's M-O-R-T-O-N. OK, and has he got your number? Yes, he has. Fine. I'll ask him to call you. Thanks very much. No problem. Bye. Goodbye. So how are you doing? Are you feeling better about finding a new job? Yeah, definitely. I'm sure I'll find something. Good. Oh, thank you, Tina. And I called Mark this morning. He wasn't there, but I left a message for him. Great. And did you speak to your boss? Did you ask about other jobs at your company? Yeah, I did. But she said there won't be anything else there. Oh, dear. Well, it was still a good idea to ask. Yes, definitely. It was good to get everything clear. I understand the situation now. Exactly. And what happened with Leo in the end? Is everything OK? I met him just now for lunch, actually. But, yeah, everything's fine. He wasn't very well, that was all. Oh, dear. Anyway, what about you? How are things here at the shop? Fine. Actually, it's been quite quiet this week. Oh, this could be Mark now. Answer it. Hello? Hi, is that Annie? Yes. Hi, it's Mark here. Oh, hi, Mark. Is now a good time? Yes, it's fine. Well, I got your message and Rachel explained you're looking for a new job. Sorry, Mark, I didn't catch that. Uh, yeah, I was just saying Rachel explained you're looking for a job. Yes, that's right. Well, look, why don't you come into the office sometime? We're always looking for new people here. Come in and we can have a chat. OK. That sounds great. How about 2.30 tomorrow? Sorry, was that 3.30 tomorrow? No, 2.30. Um. OK, that's fine. Great. Well, see you tomorrow then. Oh, I'm with Rachel and she wants to speak to you. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to ask you if you could buy a few things on your way home. Uh, we need some milk, some orange juice. Sorry, can I call you back? I've got a meeting now, so I've got to go. OK. I'll call you in about an hour. All right, speak to you soon. Bye. Bye. Oh, hi. Is that Bernice? Yes. It's Andrea here. Oh, hi. Is now a good time? Well, I'm a bit busy. Can I call you back? Sure. Call me back when you're free. Is everything OK? Yeah, fine. But I've got to go. Speak to you soon. OK. Bye. Hi, Claudia. What are you reading? I'm just looking at the course information for next year. Oh, OK. It says that one of the psychology courses I have to do is going to be online. That's good. Do you think so? I've never done an online course. I did one this year. It was great. I wouldn't mind doing my whole degree online. Really, Roberta? What's so good about it? Well, we only had about two classes on the whole course. 
and they recorded them and put them online anyway. I was free to study whenever I wanted. It's good for people like me who are always late for classes. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. But it sounds good. I mean, you still have to write essays and hand things in on time and all that kind of thing. Of course. And I got good marks on that course. But did you... I mean, didn't you miss asking your teachers questions? And what about meeting other students? Well, we could go and meet the teachers if we wanted to. You know, make an appointment and ask about something one-to-one. -one. And at the beginning of the course, we had to write an online profile. We had students from all around the world in our class, so the profiles were really interesting. How many international students were there? Uh, about 15, I think. And from all kinds of different places. Colombia, China, Morocco, Turkey, Oman, all over the place. And did they talk about their countries a lot? Yeah, that's what I really enjoyed. The only thing I'm not sure of, well, you know that my IT skills aren't very good. I'm okay making documents and using the internet. But this could be a bit more, I don't know, difficult? Not really. You don't need any special skills. It's quite easy. And there's an introduction course you can do. Yes, I was just reading about that. At least it's free. Yes, you should do it, Claudia. It's only two weeks long, and you can do it any time. It really helped me. OK, that sounds like a good idea. Hello! In today's podcast, we're going to talk about the tricky question of downloading books for free. Authors have complained recently that more and more people download their books without paying for them. So should you do it? And would you do it? We went out to discover what people think, and we asked them this question. If you wanted to read a book, would you download it without paying? Um, yes, I would, probably. If it was a book I needed for my studies, they're often so expensive, so I try to download it for free if I really needed to read it. But if it was in the library, you could get it for free anyway. Yes, but I'd probably still download it. It's a lot easier, and I could keep it then. I wouldn't have to take it back. How about you? Yeah, I agree. If I needed it for my studies, I'd look for a site where I could download it. What about a novel? A bestseller? Yes, I'd download it without paying if I could. Best-selling authors make so much money they aren't exactly poor. So why pay for a book if you can read it for free? How about you? Would you download a book without paying for it? No, I wouldn't. I always pay. I pay for other things, like clothes or gadgets, so why not pay for books? But why would you pay if you could get it for free? Someone's spent time writing them, so I think you should pay for them. I mean... If I was in a bookshop and I saw a book I liked, I wouldn't steal it. So I think it's the same with downloading books, or films, or music. It's all the same. Just because it's online, it doesn't mean you should get it for free. How about you? Would you download a book without paying for it? Well... 
Actually, I wouldn't download a book anyway. I'd buy the book. You mean in a bookshop? Yes, or I'd order it online, but as a real book. I don't like e-books. I like to have the book in my hand and keep it afterwards. And what if you could only get the book online? Well, if it wasn't available and I really wanted to read it, I might download it as an e-book. But I wouldn't download it illegally. I'd always pay for it. Why is that? Well, authors need to earn money. If they don't, they'll stop writing. Then there won't be any books anymore. Now, a new survey has shown the countries in the world where people complain the most. And to discuss the results, we've got two guests. Clara Gomez from Brazil, which is in the top ten of countries that like to complain, and Jiang Feng from China, from the bottom ten on the list. Good morning. Good morning. So, let's start with you, Clara. What do you think of the survey results? Well, I'm surprised we're in the top ten, but I'm not shocked, because things are slowly changing in Brazil. Many Brazilians have got more money these days, so they buy more and also expect better quality. If something's not good enough, they'll complain. And another thing is education. I think people know more now about the law than they used to. They know what the companies have to do, like replace things if they break easily, or giving customers their money back if the bill is wrong. So, they're asking companies to play by the rules. OK. And what about China, Feng? You're very low down the list. Do you think that's surprising? Not really. Not these days. In China, people don't really believe everything a company says. Because of this, they always like to check the products carefully before they pay for them. When you buy something online in China, you can contact the company first to check all the details of the product. It's very quick and easy to do. And then, you don't have to pay when you order. You don't even have to pay when the product arrives. You only pay if you think the product is the same as the product that the company promised. So in the end, there isn't much to complain about. Right. Well, we're also joined by John Sutherland, a journalist from the magazine What Product. Let's talk about the UK then. It seems like it's quite important to know how to complain in the UK, since we're top of the list. Yes, I think so. So, what advice do you have for someone who has to make a complaint? Well, the first thing is that you should be quick. Complain as soon as the problem happens. The same day, if possible. And also, be polite. So, choose your words carefully and don't shout. <laughs> OK. Another thing is to be clear. Give a good description of the problem. And you should also always give a date. Tell the company when you want them to do something by. So you can say you want a decision in no more than 10 days, something like that. Right. Also, don't be afraid to go to the top. Ask to speak to the manager or write to the director of the company. It can be the best way to get things done. And what's best, a phone call or a letter? 
I think letters are usually the best way to complain.、Mm. You can explain the problem in detail and avoid getting too angry. But remember, though, you should always tell them how you felt. Say how the problem spoiled your enjoyment or made your life difficult. This makes your complaint stronger. Okay. Well, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much to all our guests. Hi. Could you help me, please? Yes, of course. How can I help? Uh, I'd like to return this clock, please. Would you like to exchange it for something? No, I'd like a refund, please. Do you have a receipt? No, I don't. It was a present, you see. Well, I'm terribly sorry, but we can't give you a refund without a receipt. But it came from the shop. Look, you've got the same clock there. Yes, but without a receipt, I can't give you a refund. I'm very sorry. Is there anything wrong with it? No, it was a present, but I don't really like it. Well, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do then. Right. Could I speak to the manager, please? Of course. What seems to be the problem? Yes, I'd like to make a complaint. I have this clock. It was bought in this shop. Your sales assistant hasn't been very helpful. She won't give me a refund. He doesn't have a receipt. No, I don't have a receipt. Well, I'm sorry, but we don't do refunds without a receipt. Yes, that's what she said. Okay then, can I exchange it for something else? Is there anything wrong with it? No, there's nothing wrong with it. Can I just ask, why do you want a refund if it works okay? Well, I just. It was a present, and I'm not a big football fan, and it's a bit ugly. Well, not ugly, but it's not very adult. You know, it's more for children. I have one. I love it. Look, as it was a present, I'll let you exchange it for something else in the shop. But normally we wouldn't do this. That's very kind. So, what would you like to exchange it for? Actually, I've decided that I'll keep it. It might be useful. Well, okay then, if that's what you prefer. Yes, yes, it's fine. Thanks very much for your help. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Tim. I went to buy a new pair of jeans the other day. I was the only customer in the shop, and there were two shop assistants. They were chatting about what they did at the weekend, and when I asked for assistance, they just carried on talking. It was so rude. All I wanted to know was the price of some jeans. In the end, I decided to just leave the shop. I don't think they even noticed I was there. I felt like writing an email to the shop manager to complain, but then I forgot to. Vicky, I think it's so rude when shops or companies don't reply when someone makes a complaint. I remember once I bought a bike online. It took ages to arrive, about a month. So I wrote an email to complain, but I didn't hear anything from them. I mean. Is it too hard just to send an email saying sorry? If I were the manager of a company, I'd make sure I replied to every customer. I know it's not easy to run a business, but if you want to keep your customers happy, you should answer their emails. I won't use that company again. 
I'll go to a local shop instead. Rebecca. Look, if I invited you to my party, you'd let me know if you could come or not, wouldn't you? You'd think so. But last month I had a party and invited about 40 people, and about half of them didn't say if they were coming or not. Most of them didn't come in the end, and in my invitation I did ask them to let me know. I think that kind of behaviour is incredibly rude, don't you? I mean, I needed to know how many people were coming, so I had enough food and drink. But then I made too much food and it was embarrassing. All they needed to do was send a text or email, which is not very difficult. There are some people I invited to that party who I'll never get in touch with again. Welcome to the podcast From Fiction to Fact, where we find out about interesting ideas from books that became reality. This week, we're looking at ideas from science fiction. First up is Jules Verne. The French writer was very good at inventing stories which have excited readers for more than a hundred years. Verne was also very clever at imagining machines in his writing that would go on to become a reality. In his book, Robur the Conqueror, for instance, he describes flying machines that have propellers. Robur's albatross is more powerful and easier to move than other airships. The machine that Verne describes is quite similar to what we now know as a helicopter. The world's first successful helicopter was invented in 1939 by Igor Sikorsky, who was a Russian-American engineer. He was born in Russia, but went to live in America in 1919. When he was young, Sikorsky read Robur the Conqueror and it gave him the idea for the design of a helicopter that is still used today. Next, we look at one of the most successful science fiction stories of all time, Star Trek. There have been lots of different TV series, even a cartoon, as well as films. But for many Star Trek fans, known as Trekkies. It's the original TV series from the 1960s that they love the most. The incredible thing is that there were quite a few inventions in that TV series that are now common today. For example, the communicator that characters use to speak to each other is just like a mobile phone. And there was this other machine the replicator, which was used to make food and small objects. It's just like the 3D printers that we have today. So Star Trek science fiction has become science fact. The Blade Runner films are probably my favourite science fiction films of all time. I like the way they talk about things in the future, but at the same time, it's kind of like they're talking about things in the present, the kind of things we think about today. And I love the way the films look. They don't show a future world where everything is clean and perfect. The street scenes look real, a bit dirty and quite disorganised. Some things in the films don't exist today, for example, the skies aren't full of flying cars. But other things, like the big flying adverts in the sky, well, now there are these drones that fly around with adverts on them. It's just like Blade Runner. The future has arrived.
In 2010, Nguyen Van Tri of the Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology was at a small village restaurant. While he was eating, he saw a box of lizards on a cooking bench. He thought they looked unusual, so he sent some pictures to a biologist in America, L. Lee Grisma. When Grisma saw the pictures, he was sure the lizards were special. He wanted to be the scientist to make the discovery, so he got on a plane to Vietnam. Then he rode on a motorbike for eight hours to get from the airport to the restaurant. But unfortunately, while he was travelling, the restaurant owner cooked the lizards and served them to his customers. When Grisma arrived, they were all gone. Luckily, a nearby restaurant also had the same kind of lizards on their menu. The species of lizard was new to the scientists, but not to the Vietnamese villagers. Excuse me, can you tell me where the reception is? It's over there by the trees. Can you see the doors and the sign that says reception? Oh yes, thanks very much. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm here to see Mark Riley. What's your name, please? It's Annie Morton. Okay, I'll let him know you're here. Oh, hello, Mark. It's Sandra here at reception. I've got Annie Morton here to see you. Okay, thanks. Bye. Yes, he's expecting you. He said you can go up and see him. Have you been to his office before? No. Okay, it's on the first floor. So go up the stairs and turn left. Go through the door and turn right. Then go down the corridor and it's the first door on the right. Fine. Thank you. Sorry, I got lost. Could you tell me where the office is again, please? Yes, of course. So first, go up the stairs to the first floor and turn left. Then go through the door and turn right. So, go up the stairs to the first floor and turn left. Then go through the door and turn right. Yes. Then go down the corridor and it's the first office on the right. Sorry, the fourth office? No, the first. Right. I think I've got that. Good. So, can I just check? Go up the stairs and turn right. No, turn left. Left. Then go through the door and turn left. No, right. That's it. Thanks very much. Obviously, I can't promise anything, but I think you've a really good chance of getting a job here. Thanks, Mark. That's great. You've helped me so much. Not at all. You've got a really good CV and lots of experience. I'm sure my boss will be very impressed. I hope so. Anyway, I'll let you get back to your work now. OK. Oh, and have fun at the gym with Leo tomorrow. Thanks. I'm sure it'll be good. Do you want me to walk down with you or...? No, it's OK. I know the way out. Thanks again. Not a problem. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Hi, welcome to the show. Today we're looking at great inventions for the future. What really useful inventions do you think we need? People have called into the show to tell us their ideas. First up, we have Amir. Hi, Amir. Hi. 
So, Amir, tell us about what invention you'd like to see. I think the most important invention we need is a new kind of car engine that doesn't need petrol. There are too many cars in the world already. And as countries become richer, more and more people will want a car. That will be terrible news for the environment. But imagine a world with clean cars and no more pollution to worry about. I'm sure it will be invented soon. We already have electric cars, but I think it will be something different. Maybe something like a car that runs on air. I'm sure someone will invent something to solve the problem. I hope so anyway. Thanks, Amir. That's a great invention. Next on the line, we have Uta. Uta, tell us about your invention. Hi. Well, one really useful invention would be artificial meat that's cheap and tastes good and which doesn't need cows, sheep or chickens to produce it. It sounds like science fiction, but in fact, they've already invented it in a way. Amazingly, they've produced beef in a laboratory, but it costs thousands of pounds to make. But that's the same with all new inventions. They're always expensive at the start. So I think it will happen, and it'll be really good, because all the fields we used to grow food for cows could be used for something else to grow vegetables or plant trees, for example. Thanks, Uta. Artificial meat. Wow, that sounds scary. Anyhow, last up we have Pierre. Hi, Pierre. Hi. So, Pierre, tell us about your idea for a great invention. Well, a really useful invention I read about was a device that you could put in your ear and it would translate languages for you. You wouldn't need to study for hours and hours to learn a foreign language. You could just put it in your ear when you went on holiday to foreign countries and you'd understand everything everyone was saying to you. It would help people to communicate and would be very useful for business people or for politicians. But it wouldn't be very good news for teachers. Fortunately for them, it's probably impossible to make such a device. Or, at least, it will take many years. Cool. I love that invention. Thanks for those great ideas. Who knows which of them will happen? We can only wait and see. A parrot in Denver, USA, became a hero when it helped to save the life of a two-year-old girl. Megan Howard, the parrot's owner, was looking after two-year-old Hannah. It was morning and Hannah was eating her breakfast on her own because Megan had gone to the bathroom. While Megan was in the bathroom, the parrot, Willie, started to make a very strange noise. Megan realised something bad had happened. Willie started screaming the words, Mama, Baby, again and again. Megan said she had never heard the parrot scream like that before. She came out of the bathroom to see what was happening, and when she looked at Hannah, she saw that her face had gone blue. Some of Hannah's breakfast had got stuck in her throat, she couldn't breathe because the food was still there. Luckily for Hannah, Megan had learned what to do in this situation. She immediately ran over to her and performed the Heimlich manoeuvre. Hannah started to breathe again normally. And once Willie saw that Hannah was okay, he stopped screaming. 
Willie the parrot was given a prize by the Red Cross for his actions. He was named Animal Hero of the Year, and they gave him a box of cereal with his picture on it. Hannah's mum thanked both Megan and Willie and said she thought they had both saved Hannah. Claire, my little sister and I have always had our fights. I think the funniest time was when I made her ride a cow. We lived in a house with a field of cows on one side, and I told my sister that they were horses. I went into the field and stood behind the cows, making horse noises. When the cows were right next to our garden fence, I said she could ride one of the horses, just like a cowboy. I still can't believe she listened to me. She just jumped off the fence onto a cow's back. The cow was very surprised. It ran away with my sister holding onto its back. I couldn't stop laughing. In the end, my sister fell off. Her clothes were really dirty, and she was crying. Then I felt bad and helped her back home. When we got back, I told my mum my sister had tried to ride a cow, and I had saved her. She believed me. I still feel guilty. Jeremy. I often used to play with my younger brother, but we did fight a lot too. I remember one time when I was really mean to him. That day, my parents had burnt some leaves in the garden, and the fire was still a bit hot. So I had an idea for a joke to play on my brother. We had an old kettle in the garden. It was really dirty. I told my brother I was going to make grass soup, <laughs> so I took some grass and put it in the dirty old kettle with some water. I put it on the fire for a minute, then I poured some into a cup and gave it to my brother. It was a horrible brown orange color with green bits of grass in it. He didn't look very sure about drinking it, so I put the cup near my mouth and told him I had drunk some and it was delicious. I hadn't even tasted it, of course. I gave him the cup and he drank all of it. Later that evening, my brother said he wasn't feeling very well. My parents wanted to know why, so really. I had to tell them about my soup. Tanya, my sister's a year and a half older than me, and we always got on well. When we were little, we were very similar and did everything together. But then she started to read a lot, and she was very strong for her age. I didn't mind, but I didn't like the attention she got from my parents. One day, some of my parents' friends came to visit us. My dad told them he was very proud of my sister because she could read so well. I got really angry, so I went to the bookcase in the hall and chose five of the biggest, thickest books I could see. Then I went back to my parents and their friends and said I had just finished reading the books. My dad asked me to describe the stories. I had no idea, so I just looked at the front of the books and guessed. So I talked about a happy king with lots of rings. That was Lord of the Rings, and also lots of stories about people with names beginning with N. That was Volume Twelve of an encyclopedia. I could hear my sister laughing in the other room the whole time. But I'm afraid Nissan is actually Korean. Uh, 
I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it's Japanese. I'm sorry, but it's definitely Korean. I remember reading an article about the factories in South Korea. Well, maybe Nissan have factories in Korea, but that doesn't mean it's a Korean company. I think they just make some of them in Korea. Maybe you're thinking of Toyota. That's a Japanese company. That's right. Toyota is the biggest Japanese car company. Exactly. Yes, but the second biggest is Nissan. Then Honda, probably. Or maybe Suzuki. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But firstly, Nissan isn't a Japanese company, like I said. And then, Mazda is a much bigger company than Suzuki or Honda. I'm not sure about that. I think they're all a very similar size. And Nissan is Japanese. No, I really think... Oh, never mind. It's not important. Maybe you're thinking of Mitsubishi. They're a big Japanese company. No, I have a Nissan. That's what I'm talking about. In Korea, there's Kia, and I'm sure Nissan. So when do you start the new job? Next month. I'm a bit nervous, actually. Oh, don't worry. You'll be fine. Just remember... Maybe you were right. I don't know now. No, I'm sure it's not Japanese. Really? It doesn't matter. I know. I can check on my phone. Hi. Or Chinese. Maybe it's Chinese. Well, what's he talking about? Do they make cars in China? I think they do. Mark. Be quiet. Rock music is the best kind of music. I'm not sure about that. Classical music is more relaxing. Basketball is the most interesting sport. That's true. It's so fast and exciting. Beach holidays are boring. You're absolutely right. I prefer to stay in big cities. English food is boring. Oh, please. It's much more interesting than it used to be. It's a bad idea to listen to music when you study. I'm sorry, but I think it helps you concentrate. This is Jennifer Long reporting live from Texas. I've just been given new information about Hurricane Harvey. The latest we've heard is that it's crossing the Texas coast. Wind speeds have already reached 200 kilometers an hour, and we expect around 88 centimeters of rain in the affected areas tonight. With me is firefighter Stevie Black. Stevie, what kind of damage are we expecting tonight? A lot of serious damage, we think. We haven't been able to get out and really see what's happening. So we're just watching reports right now. The winds are just too strong at the moment. It's not safe, so we have to stay inside the fire station. We've heard reports that there are people trapped in buildings. Will you try to rescue people during the night? Not with the wind as strong as this, no. It's too dangerous to be out in the street even in the fire truck, so, uh, we just have to wait and hope. All right, let's go back live to Houston. Jennifer Long is reporting for us from one of the worst of the flooded areas. Jennifer, it looks like you're on a boat. Yes, I'm here on a boat with some local volunteers. 
They say they've rescued at least a hundred people so far. I've got Emilio Chavez with me. He's leading this rescue team. Emilio, it's been a difficult day for you, hasn't it? Yes, it's just been crazy. We've probably made about a hundred rescues today. Old people, kids, babies, cats, dogs, you name it. And are people happy to leave their homes, or do some people still want to stay? What have you seen? Most people are okay. Some people want to stay, but, you know, we try to convince them that it's safer to leave and just go, be somewhere safe for their families. We tell them they can always come back, and then they're quite happy to go. Mostly, yeah. And we have another gentleman here. I'm sorry, what's your name? Tom. Tom Myers. Now, Tom, you live close by, don't you? Yeah, I live right across the street, and it was nothing like this before, even just a few hours ago. I was out walking my dog this morning, and now, look at it. It's... There are cars underwater. Everywhere you look, water up to the windows. We've got nearly 1.5 meters of water right now. It's pretty bad. <laughs>